a continuación nos acompaña la ingeniera Justine Sider, quien nos hablará sobre la estrategia de Canadá para favorecer el Internet de las Cosas. Sider es ingeniera senior de Spectro en el Departamento de Ingeniería de Servicios Móviles de Industry Canada. Ha trabajado en una variedad de campos de servicios móviles y fijos, incluyendo servicios móviles comerciales, pequeñas celdas, Wi-Fi, dispositivos de corto alcance y radio aficionados. Ha trabajado en el Departamento de Ingeniería, Política y Licenciamiento de Redes Inalámbricas de Industry Canada y ha representado los intereses de Canadá en, el, en la Unión Internacional de Telecomunicaciones UIT y la Comisión Interamericana de Telecomunicaciones CITEL. Démosle la bienvenida a la ingeniera Saider. Buenas tardes a todos y muchas gracias por la, a la ANE por la invitación de presentar aquí. Uh, es un gran placer estar en Bogotá, trabajar con colegas y amigos y sobre todo porque aquí es, hace calor y en Canadá es muy frío. <ríe> El invierno empezó la semana pasada. Entonces vamos a pasar en inglés para hablar de de las estrategias para promover el Internet de las Cosas. Entonces, uh, so my presentation is in three parts. In the first part, I'm going to quickly look at what are these things that we talk about when we're talking about the Internet of Things. The second part, I'll be looking at ongoing international work to present to, to promote the Internet of Things and where, where you can get involved. And in the third part, I'll talk Uh, mostly about uh, the Canadian approach to international engagement to ensure that Canadian interests are reflected in international standards and allocations for spectrum. Okay, so in this slide, it's a slide I took uh, from the ITU. Um, and um, we can see that for the Internet of Things, what we're really talking about is, you know, three types of relationships, devices to devices, devices to people and people to people. And the idea is that anywhere, anytime, um, in any place, we can be connected. And I think um, some of our esteemed colleagues talked a little bit about this yesterday. And you know, one of the questions is, um, do we really want to be connected all the time, anywhere we are? Um, do we want to be sending all kinds of personal information over networks? Um, I'm not here to answer that question, but I think it's a very important question that was raised yesterday. Uh, by some of our colleagues. Um, um, so when we talk about some of these things, what are these things? In many cases, we're talking about uh, short-range devices, very low-power devices, RFIDs, hearing aids, medical implants, meters, sensors. Um, and these things enable a multitude of smart applications and services, smart grids, home automation, telehealth, intelligent transportation systems. Uh, they produce a lot of data, big data. We heard a lot about that yesterday and today. And uh, for me, from my area of expertise, really what we're looking at are the connections that they make wirelessly, that is through licensed and unlicensed uh, networks, such as Wi-Fi networks. Um, and also, these things are, in many cases, consumer devices. They need to be cheap for them to be adopted en masse. Um, so when we look at that, we look at ecosystems that can be created for these types of devices that are driven by international harmonization, and I'll get to that uh, shortly. Um, they also need uh, spectrum, as I mentioned, unlicensed and licensed spectrum. And uh, some of my colleagues uh, also mentioned uh, throughout the last two days, um, you know, how much spectrum, or raise the issue of how much spectrum is needed for these devices to work effectively and efficiently. Um, and I don't have an answer for that. Okay, so um, I'm going to ask the computer guys to just click on the Cisco slide, if, if you can right click on the slide, so we can get to uh, a picture that I think is Uh, shows really um, the complexity and the simplicity at the same time of what the Internet of Things is. Um, in the first... <laughs> okay, so we can just um, scroll up 
Uh, this is one of my favorite slide, uh, pictures when we talk about the Internet of Things. Um, if we scroll down a little bit, uh, the picture, the images I like the most um, when you scroll down is you see uh, how all of these things relate to each other wirelessly uh, through the Internet. Um, and I think that uh, what this slide also highlights is that wireless connections are critical to the implementation of the Internet of Things. And so are standards because um, as if we look down a little bit on the slide, you have an alarm clock talking to my car, uh, talking to the taxis. Um, you know, all of this can only happen if there's interoperability between all of these standards so that in my case, um, my alarm clock can start my coffee maker a few minutes before I wake up and have that perfect cappuccino ready for me in the morning. And if it's been snowing a lot in Canada the night before, my phone will tell me um, or turn on my car and start defrosting the car. And I'll know that I have to get up a little bit earlier so that I can take all the snow off my front walk so that I can get out of my house. So for all of this to work, I think uh, the complexity is, is in the implementation and ensuring that the standards can talk to, that the standards are interoperable, as I said, so that all of these devices um, can talk to us. And I think from this morning we heard about the importance of global standards for, for, for cell phones and how um, the evolution from all of these proprietary standards and non-interoperable standards to one global standard really assists with economies of skills and adoption of, of new technologies. Okay, if we can go back to the, um, the slide, please. Okay. Um, again, so when we talk about uh, all of this work is happening in standards bodies and in international and regional uh, organizations, so we need to focus our efforts in those areas. So how, what are the strategies that we can implement to achieve this? Okay, so um, as I mentioned, I would be talking about where some of this work is happening internationally. The Plenty Pot just ended in October. Um, importantly, for the Internet of Things, there was a resolution that was adopted at the uh, Plenty Pot, and the Plenty Pot agreed to continue the relevant work of the ITUT, the International Telecommunications Standardization Sector's work uh, on enabling the ITUT. Importantly, they talked about increasing global cooperation between the ITUT and many standards development organizations that are working on various aspects of the Internet of Things. Um, to you know, increase the interoperability of these IoT services. And the Plenty Pod importantly invited member states, sector members, associates, and academia to participate actively in these studies. Um, so the, the, the takeaway from all this is that collaborations will enhance interoperability, um, which is the key to the Internet of Things, uh, so as to avoid conflicting standards, duplication of work. Um, okay, so just briefly within the ITU, much of the work is done in the ITUT. As you can see, there are a number of uh, focus groups and study groups looking at various aspects of uh, the Internet of Things. There's the IoT GSI, the Global Standards Initiative, the Joint Coordination Activity on the Internet of Things. Um, continuing with that, um, the ITUT view of the IOT is that the success of this will depend on the existence and smooth and effective operation of global standards, which is a theme that we've been hearing the past uh, couple of days. Um, and as I mentioned, the ITUT, uh, a lot of the work takes place um, uh, within the ITUT, but it also in, in coordination with other standards organizations and within uh, different sectors of the ITU as well. Uh, in the radio communication uh, sector of the ITU, which is what I know uh, best, um, we see that in Working Party 5A there, was a, there is a question to scope out the types of work that will be done uh, in looking at uh, sensor networks and machine-to-machine -machine communications. Um, we also have a lot of work taking place in Working Party 1D to implement ITUR Resolution 54 on the harmonization of short-range <coughs> devices, and I will get to that shortly. 
Um, there's also the global standards uh, um, collaboration. Um, and I, I highlight this because machine to machine communications was recently um, listed as one of the top three priority topics for the GSC. And for those of you who are not familiar with the GSC, the GSC brings together participating standards development organizations from various regions of the world to facilitate the exchange of information on standards and the development of standards. And uh, the goal is, again, to reduce duplication of efforts. And again, they say that standards play a major role in the development of technologies that bring benefits to consumers and businesses. Okay, finally now I'll get to the Canadian approach to international engagement and what is our strategy for doing that. Um, so again, we, uh, our major point here is that we participate in international organizations to ensure that standards and spectrum allocations reflect uh, our Canadian interests. And we work uh, with others uh, in various regional and international institutions to implement that uh, goal. Um, for standards, uh, you know, we adopt a lot of standards by reference. They form the technical basis of our rules. So we want to make sure that uh, we're in agreement with those standards. Um, and again, on spectrum, when well, we talk about spectrum allocations and standards, uh, technical rules in the ITUR radio regulations, um, again, harmonization for us is, is something that we always aim to do. Uh, except where our, our, you know, some in, our own Canadian interests could warrant a different determination, but certainly we, we do work through international organizations to, to implement um, this strategy. Okay, so uh, just briefly, we advance our spectrum inter interests in uh, CTEL PCC2, which is the radio communications sector of CTEL, the uh, Inter-American Telecommunications Commission. Through the ITUR, we work through a variety of international standards development bodies to develop standards. These, these are some of them, the IEEE, ISO, IEC, CISPR, ANSI, TIA. And we also uh, work through standards organizations such as the ITUT and CTEL PCC1. Uh, within CTEL PCC1, uh, there is a number of activities underway on the Internet of Things and we participate in particular on the working group on development of technologies and services. Um, the Rapporteur on Innovation and Trends is, uh, works is a colleague of mine in Industry Canada. And again, we participate in PCC1 to make sure that our views are reflected in any decisions and outcomes of these organizations. Um, so this is the guiding uh, framework we have in Canada uh, when we talk about our spectrum management activities, and they're informed by this document, our spectrum policy framework for Canada. And our overall objective, we have, there's only one objective for that uh, whole framework. It's to maximize the economic and social benefits that Canadians derive from the use of radio, the radio frequency spectrum resource. Um, and my colleague from GSA, GSMA just before me spoke about the economic and social benefits of the Internet of Things. And more broadly, uh, I would say uh, these benefits also derive, in a general sense, from the use of the spectrum. There's eight enabling guidelines, but specifically relating to our approach to international work, there are two in particular that we should uh, advance our interests and defend them internationally, <coughs> and that our spectrum policy and management should support the efficient functioning of markets. because. Uh, and we do this by, by working toward the goal, which is to harmonize spectrum allocations. Again, so in summary, this is our default position as we support the global harmonization and coordination of radio frequency allocations and technical standards through the ITU. And we also work to achieve this goal via regional and international organizations such as standards bodies. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the benefits of global harmonization. Um, we have a document that was published a few years ago looking specifically at commercial mobile spectrum. Um, again, uh, the, the overall uh, guiding principle of this document is to support the global harmonization and coordination of frequency allocations and standards. Um, in particular, when you harmonize, 
You contribute to greater certainty for manufacturers. They can design and manufacture one device that meets the requirements on a global scale uh, rather than multiple devices to suit individual country uh, requirements. And again, you have larger markets, which in turn lead to larger technology ecosystems. So greater economies of scale, more affordable equipment uh, for the end user. So uh, we have worked through the World Radio Communication Conferences and the ITUR uh, to advance work uh, moving from commercial mobile spectrum to uh, short-range devices. Uh, we have uh, worked on an agenda item at the last World Radio Conference looking at uh, harmonizing spectrum for short-range devices. Um, we've worked through CTEL to build up an inter-American position on that. We felt it was important to come with a regional position on the importance of harmonizing spectrum for short-range devices, the, the device, the things in the Internet of Things. And we also worked through Resolution 54 of the uh, radio assembly to achieve on studies to achieve harmonization for these devices. And we've also worked quite extensively through Working Party 1B, which again, through various recommendations and reports, is looking at um, short range devices and the importance of harmonizing spectrum and technical rules. Um, I call this a soft harmonization approach because um, harmonization for these things takes place through uh, via non-binding resolutions and recommendations and reports that are developed uh, in the ITUR um, because these devices use the, the, frequent, the radio spectrum on a no interference, no protection basis. So there's no allocation in the international table. Nevertheless, you, uh, work still takes place within the ITUR to work at regional and global harmonization of frequencies and technical rules uh, for these devices. Because in, a, in essence, the ITUR recognizes that while each country is sovereign in its ability to make decisions on the technical rules and the frequencies in which these devices of the Internet of Things will ultimately operate, uh, there, are great there are great benefits to harmonizing uh, international band usage and technical rules. Um, again, I won't repeat myself, but these are some of the benefits that the ITR resolution recognizes uh, for uh, harmonization for, um, for things such as you know, RFIDs and medical telemetry devices and all kinds of medical devices, for example. Um, so again, even though it's not harmonized through allocations in the table of allocation, there's still a great merit to this type of approach. Um, and I would highlight here that this really uh, um, plays well into the Canadian approach that we try to advance internationally. It's that Canada is a very small market, too small for Canada-only solutions to these types of implementations of devices and uh, deployment uh, in spectrum. So we look for you know, global solutions, really, for both licensed and unlicensed deployment uh, bands that are unlicensed and licensed so that we can deploy these types of devices. And again, our focus is consulting domestically with our industry and then again uh, collaborating internationally to achieve this goal. Um, so we, um, Resolution 54 talks about the growth, um, the increasing demand for and use of these devices. Um, some predict the number of machine-to-machine -machine devices will reach, we've heard, 50 billion by 2020. M-to-M um, -M connections uh, are set to increase tremendously in terms of the, the, their, their percentage of the total global mobile connections uh, that take place in license spectrum. Um, so again, we, we see that these are GSMA numbers, I believe, that about half or almost half of these connections will go through mobile networks. Um, so the concept of connecting anything to anyone at any time is, is on its way to being, to being realized. But again, there are important implications for spectrum use um, in both licensed and unlicensed bands, uh, standardization uh, um, of, of uh, protocols and devices. So in conclusion, in terms of uh, 
a strategy to implement the implement of the Internet of Things. Um, again, I would highlight that international and regional engagement allows small market countries, for us, such as Canada, to have a say in spectrum use and allocation and standards. Uh, it, you know, it ensures that our interests are advanced, and uh, in our case specifically, we are uh, a market ten times smaller than the American market, which is right south of us. Uh, however, we don't always have the exact same interests. So, in participation and engagement internationally allows us to to um, to find our solutions that work for us as well in terms of implementing um, spectrum and, and adopting technical requirements and standards. And again, uh, as I said earlier, our position is always to harmonize. That's our default position. That's the goal that we strive to attain. Um, and our strategy, of course, revolves around implementing that goal. And, uh, and these are, you know, in, in the future, it will allow us even greater mobility than we have today. And it will allow these devices, because of the importance of global ecosystems, to be affordable and implementable in most every day th um, of our devices, such as coffee machines. And we don't even, won't even think about it possibly in the future. So thank you very much. Muchas gracias.